Welcome to another exciting edition of the Growth Clinic. Uh, for those of you that haven't been here before, Growth Clinic is a community event we host each week at 12 Eastern time. And uh, what we do is we feature an expert from our team to share our insights and answer your questions on the latest and greatest digital marketing topics. And the whole goal here is to help you guys grow and succeed in your business and careers in marketing. Um, so we're here to help you. We want to hear from you. So uh, please use the chat and comments uh, to add comments and questions as we go through here. Um, and if you enjoy the session, please invite your colleagues, your friends to join um, through the registration link in the calendar event. And of course, if you ever have, ever have any questions about the tools or resources or stuff we cover here today, shoot us an email. I'll drop my email in the chat. Um, just uh, reach out and I'm happy to hook you up. Um, so quick intro. I'm Jared Flegel. I am Director of Marketing here at Web Mechanics, joined by our fearless leader as always, Mr. Uh, Chris Mechanic, our CEO. And uh, we have a special guest with us here today, who I will announce in just a moment, because uh, today we're talking about strategies. So today we're covering secrets to building a winning digital marketing strategy, right? So, um, you know, some folks are renewing their fiscal right now, others that starts Jam 1, and we're kind of mid-year and we're looking at how's our strategy performing and looking to make tweaks or pivots. So I figure this is a perfect time to talk about how do we think about strategy? How do we integrate strategy? How does strategy inform tactics that we execute um, and the channels that we use to um, drive, our, drive our strategy and all that good stuff. Um, so the person that's going to educate us on strategy um, is a man who uh, is near and dear to my heart, uh, who is, uh, has been with Web Mechanics for many years, um, leading uh, SEO, and more recently has moved into director strategy role here at Web Mechanics. Um, he's built strategies for clients across multiple industries. Um, he's a digital marketing wizard um, and a colleague of mine from college on a personal note. Um, so uh, fellow English major. Um, so uh, without further ado, welcome Alex Swope to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Been here for seven years and been very blessed to be a jack of all trades across a lot of different of the, the service areas. Also being in a full service marketing agency because you get to do SEO, PPC, marketing ops, copywriting. I yep. got to do a little development, got to work closely with design teams. Uh, and so now I'm lucky enough to get to share that experience and kind of that Swiss army knife uh, type of role uh, across a lot of our you know clients, work with a lot of different people and see a lot of different situations. So I've got plenty of stuff I can talk about for an hour. But like Jared said, we want this to be interactive. I want this to be extremely useful for your, uh, your ears and your businesses. So um, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's have some good conversations. Let's do it. Awesome. Um, so question in the chat here, um, just uh, the, among the, the, those of us who are here, um, it, drop in the chat if you're a B2B or B2C brand. Uh, Rachel, I know you guys are obviously a B2C, but, um, you know, uh, go ahead and share that in the chat. And um, B2B, love it. Um, and yeah, okay, B2B. So it sounds like we got a mix here. A little bit of B2B, a little bit of B2C. Okay, cool. So it looks like we can kind of work both angles. That's great. Mm -hmm. cool. um, Good. So let's start off at a high level, Alex. Um, so, you know, I guess zooming out in a thousand foot view, why do we need a digital marketing strategy? Like, like obviously we need a, a marketing strategy to guide our decisions, but why a digital marketing strategy in particular? Like, what does that do for us? Yeah, so I find that in a channel like digital, a lot of people are in it because everybody's in digital, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, it, you can think back to like 2006 when uh, it was like, oh, should I get a business social media account? And it's like, well, everybody else has one, so I better get one too. Um, and so a lot of people building these programs and things uh, because they know it's a space they need to play in, but they may not, they may not put the rigor to it that they might a traditional marketing program if you were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on print advertising that you you know are making a huge investment all at once you would have that really lock tight strategy right um a lot of people times people um gloss over that a little bit more with digital i think because it's a lot of self-service platforms and a lot of like do-it-yourself kind of things um but when i talk about strategy what i'm really talking about is do we know what the challenges or opportunities are do we know what our goals are? And do we know, do we have a plan of how we're going to reach those goals by addressing those challenges or taking advantage of those opportunities? So like, if I had to kind of bring it in, that's what I mean when I'm talking about strategy. And if you don't have that, then it's really hard to evaluate your programs and see whether or not they're doing the things you need them to do in order to reach the marketing, sales, revenue, business goals and objectives. Um, that you have. Yep, that makes total sense. And 
yeah, it also helps you determine like, okay, like there are all these tactics, like the reality of digital is there's so many things you could do, right? So many channels, we run Facebook ads, we could do Google, we could do SEO, we could hmm. all this different stuff, but a strategy helps you understand like, you know, what is our goal? And then what is our North star, right? And how do we, how can we get there, right? What's the overall sort of path that we're going to take to get there? And then we can figure out like, do we need to take a boat? Do we need to, you know, drive a car here? Like, what are the different steps in, the, in that path, right? So without a strategy, you're just kind of testing different tactics without any real cohesive plan to, under, to help guide it and understand whether it's, it's successful or not. Um, so yeah, Alex, I think that's, that's aptly put. Um, and so, and so along the, oh, sorry. Yeah. Just along the idea of strategy and forming tactics. I mean, that's, that's the number one reason that I think you need a strategy and it's both, I, I mean, working with multinational, very complex companies with many, many products and service lines, many, many different channels and countries that they're working in and operating in. Obviously those people need uh, an orchestrated marketing strategy just to keep track of everything and make sure everything's kind of like working together. Mm -hmm. But the, I'm not going to say small companies, but companies that don't have massive, massive resources for their marketing and sales teams need to prioritize strategy even more so because they can't afford to accidentally put $10,000 into the wrong channel or the wrong tactic or whatever. So the strategy, you know, <laughs> should help us make sure that we're aligned and directing our efforts towards the things that are gonna help us reach our goals. So I've got a couple examples of different ways you might choose some tactics based on different strategies. Um, and I've got B2B and B2C um, yeah. examples here. So um, a lot of times if we look at strategy and what our goals are and what we need to do, a lot of times it's aligning a better channel to whatever that objective is. Um, so for example, I've seen clients that uh, the board of directors is really concerned about visibility on certain top level, uh, very high volume, very broad keywords that may not have a lot of business relevance, but from a brand standpoint, that's a very important uh, KPI for them is what's our brand visibility across these different topic areas. They were reaching that objective through paid search, which was causing them to spend tens of thousands of dollars on keywords that weren't generating any revenue for them, right? Weren't leading to any even like leads or conversions. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something I look at and I'm like, great. If that's your business goal and objective, let's build a strategy that makes more sense. Let's maybe take some of that resourcing, pull it into an SEO program where you can start to build these, uh, high level informational pieces of content that are gonna draw in people searching for these topics without us having to spend a lot of advertising budget on that. Yep. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's one instance where, okay, you've got a strategy, but have we aligned the correct tactic to it? Um, and then, uh, you know, on the, on the other uh, end of things, uh, we had a, uh, a client who, as we were looking at the data and seeing what we could do to improve it, what strategy pivots do we need to make, we were seeing that there was a good deal of lead generation going on. Awesome. Love to see that. You know, our frontline KPIs are looking very, very uh, solid, but we weren't seeing them translate into sales down the funnel. So there's this middle portion where we're seeing the drop off. What can we do about that? You know, you think about it, you talk about what's the brand sentiment, you talk to the sales team to figure out what's going on, what are the conversations happening, find out a lot of people are highly skeptical of the product itself because it's in an industry that's like had some regulation problems in the past, people are skeptical of it. So great, let's make them not skeptical of it. Let's put really good, uh, positive content out there. Uh, and just blanket our audience in good vibes so that when they encounter our product or service, they like it. Uh, so we could do that again through SEO. We could do that through a, uh, you know, kind of paid search campaign if we really wanted to. But since we're targeting prospects, a retargeting campaign, native advertising, native advertising looks very uh, trustworthy. And so again, we're trying to put out a positive competing message to change the sentiment of our audience and our prospects. So retargeting native, you know, that's, that's a good 
fit for that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, I could give you more examples, but if we are strategically identifying what's the challenge, people have a poor negative sentiment of our product or service, um, but we can get them in the door, we can capture their lead information. We just can't close them. Great, now we've identified what the challenge is. Um, and then you know the tactics become, how do we solve that problem? Yeah, so it sounds like in terms of strategy, like the approach is first, like get a lay of the land, understand you know, what are the issues, what are the goals, what are the challenges? Then once we have that data, we can hone in on like, what's that top challenge that we need to tackle right now? And if we tackle this one challenge, you know, even at the expense of all the other challenges, you know, we're going to make a big impact on the ultimate business outcome that this business is looking to achieve. And then the strategy of how we use marketing to drive that business outcome, you know, falls underneath that, right? So we're kind of mm -hmm. honing in on like, where is the opportunity in this business and thinking from a business level, you know, um, not just looking at like the surface level metrics of like Google ads or like what our lead you know, conversion rates are, things like that, but really thinking beyond that to look at the business holistically to see where can we add the most value with marketing, right? And then yeah. that dictates the tactics and the, the approaches that'll help us drive that result, drive that outcome. Does that sound right? Yes. And, you know, I, a lot of times when people say strategy and, you know, I'm as susceptible to having my ego stroked as anyone. I love to think like, oh, I'm the super smart guy that does strategy. But this stuff is not rocket science. There's a predictable process to generating this stuff. And I want, at least hopefully in the next 45 minutes, to show you some like things that you can take home with you to help generate these ideas and some takeaways that are like next steps. You can go straight to your, um, you know, your team and say, hey, let's do X, Y, Z in order to start, you know, reevaluating our you know, first half of the year and see if we need to change anything for the second half of the year. Um, because I, I want to demystify this process and make it something that uh, everyone feels like they're aligned and can, and can do. Um, and so yeah. I, yeah, sorry, go if you had something. No, I was just saying, saying let's dive into that. So, um, yeah. so how do we start demystifying the process? Like, how do we go about step-by-step -step, um, yeah. building a digital marketing strategy? And I guess one question to start is like, are there things we should do before digital building a digital marketing strategy? And yeah, if you have anything to share with us, feel free to let screen me, share. The, the floor is yours. <laughs> let me, yeah, let me, let me bring this up. Um, so yeah. this is, uh, as part of my role, I developed our, you know, strategic process here at Web Mechanics. And this is what I built as kind of like the robust, you can see it's like a six week plan. It's got a lot of steps in it. It goes through several rounds of iteration in terms of like internal review and things like that. Um, but this is not always necessary. If, if you're kind of starting this process and you've never done anything like this before in terms of like really deep diving into the historic performance data to see where the opportunities are in the data um, and things like that, this can be very valuable. Um, but I'll also have some like shortcut style stuff in here. Uh, and, and hopefully that'll, that'll be useful, but you can see kind of in this onboarding phase, uh, what are we doing? We're confirming the business goals, right? That's the number one thing that we need to have before we set any kind of strategy is, okay, we've got business goals, right? We need X amount of revenue. How much of that is going to be generated by sales, upsells and things like that, uh, that your sales seems to be working with your existing prop, you know? Uh, prospect and customer list, how much of that needs to be net new and how much of that needs to be marketing driven. And then how much of that needs to be digital marketing driven? Because once you've got that, you say, great, I need to drive a million dollars in pipeline value. I have a condition that I want to be at 10 X ROI. So I would probably want to dedicate a hundred thousand dollars to that program, right? If I spend $100,000 and get a million dollars in revenue, I've achieved my 10X ROI. So that can give us like very, very, very broad constraints under which to build strategy. Um, and if we don't have that, it's really difficult to know how much effort we need to place into any channel or uh, opportunity, right? Um, and that's probably... Seems obvious, but I, it's something that you have to make sure you have it ideally written in writing with numbers, exactly what we need to hit. Yeah, I, I think that the takeaway okay. in my mind, Alex, is like, if so say, say I'm like 
starting a new role as a marketer and I'm doing my 30, 60, 90 plan, um, you know, when I'm getting in there, I need to, I need to confirm the business and marketing goals, but I also can't take things for granted or at surface level, right? Like if one team tells me this, you know, uh, like if the sales team says, this is true, I can't just like assume that's like the whole picture. Like I have to get the full picture to understand like how, how the team's operating, are there competing goals, right? Is there, and so that, that way that allows me to sort of sit back objectively and see like, where is the bottle, bottleneck really, right? Like maybe I was hired to do this one thing and execute this one channel or program, but then, you know, I look at what's actually going on. I figure out, oh, the bottleneck is actually mm. here, right? So um, I, I think one of the things this process allows you to do, if I'm bringing this right, Alex, is identify, like, not just take for granted, like what you were told when you were hired or like what you're being told by other departments or other teams, but really to get the big picture to understand where the actual challenge is so that you can attack that and make the biggest impact possible. Absolutely. And yep. that, I don't want to generalize, but there's a lot of conversation between sales and marketing where sales says, my leads aren't good enough, marketing, go get me better leads. And marketing says, well, according to the conditions you gave me for what's qualified, it looks like we're providing you a bunch of qualified leads. Um, and then this, there's this kind of like, you know, finger pointing uh, game, right? Looking at the data and focusing on the data is going to allow us to try to cut through some of that. And instead of pointing fingers, we're pointing at challenges and opportunities, right? And then just figuring out as a team, how do we solve this, right? So um, that's where we start with kind of the quantitative analysis is really getting into the data, uh, your CRM data, um, getting access to that data uh, from the agency side is always part of one of our um, important things, but also looking at that data with a Salesforce admin or somebody that knows the data and can pull what we're looking for and show us around, it's extremely, extremely valuable. Um, and so take advantage of that if you have uh, you know, someone that's administrating your CRM to make sure that when you're looking at the data, you're looking at it in the way that, you know, everyone agrees on, you know, the, the meaning of it. Let me uh, kind of look, walk through a process um, that's very consistent that we call uh, a funnel math and goal gap analysis, because this is really where you're going to start to identify those opportunities and build a strategy just using numbers, you know, it, it, again, Let's not turn this into rocket science. So um, something that we'll often do is use historic rates for people moving through a pipeline, right? Marketing, often very interested in generating leads and MQLs, but um, you know, once those MQLs, I've got a little black bar here uh, that's hard to see, but once those MQLs become opportunities, a lot of times that's like, okay, that's now the sales team, right? But so putting this whole funnel look into one chart allows us to see where the drop-offs are. And again, this isn't your data, so it probably is gonna look a little um, funny, but if we uh, just kind of go forward here, I'll show you. Um, you know, we plug in the data from the historics so that we can get these click to lead rate, lead to MQL rate, MQL to you know, their, their next stage, basically setting a meeting and then uh, that meeting to opportunity rate and the pipeline that was generated, right? So great, we've got the historic data and we can use this to basically say, great, if we use, if we did business as usual for the next time period, this is probably about where we would end up if we didn't change anything, right? Like let's not assume that things are gonna magically improve without us putting a lot of effort into it. So we generated that much, but that's short of our goal that we need to hit, right? So then we go ahead and we put in an improved forecast where we go through and we see what rates, what numbers in this chart need to change in order for us to hit the pipeline number that we have in our goal, right? So teal boxes, I'm showing a click to lead improvement 3.4 to 4%, lead to MQL 34 to 40, uh, set meetings at a 20% rate, and, you know, this historical data, we didn't like that data point. We were like, that's probably not accurate. There's not enough data on opportunities. So let's put in a ballpark of 75%. We think that's going to be more, more accurate for our projections. Um, and sure enough, great. Now we're forecasted to hit our goal of, you know, $3.3 million in opportunity. 
And we know exactly what our performance needs to be throughout the whole pipeline in order to hit that. And we also have you know, an estimated budget that we need. And then the question becomes, how do we make these improvements, right? So already at this moment, we've identified where the opportunities and challenges are. But we've got a challenge that our, you know, our rate at which we set uh, meetings from our MQLs is not as high as we need it, be, need it to be. So we can look at that challenge and say, great, how could we fix that one thing? And that's how we build each part of the strategy. Um, I just want to pause there and you know ask for for questions from from the audience as well as any commentary from from Jared, Chris, uh, anything you want to add? Yeah, just quick temperature to check from the audience if this is helpful because um, this is like this is like the cheat code. This is like how you get buy in, you know, to get the resources you actually need to hit your targets, right? Because um, you know, it's one thing to kind of take the, the budgets you've been given and, and, and say, hey, okay, let's work with what we got. But if you can come to your executives with a report like this that basically says, hey, you know, we're here today. Um, and if we continue along this path, this is going to be our outcome and it's not where we want to be. But if we make these changes, then this is how we're going to get to our goal. And then when we talk, when you identify how you make those improvements, you can tell the, the executive team, this is how we're going to do it, right? So you're able to tell that complete story of like, when we change the budget, and when we change these things in our process, we're going to get this result. And that paints a clear story for your executives of these are the resources we need. This is what we need to do. And this is what we need to de dedicate to hit that result. And you get that tight alignment with you know, your sales team and with your executive team. And just imagine if you organized your marketing efforts and reporting around having presented this plan to your you know, executive team having them aligned to it and saying like, yeah, this looks pretty good. And then saying, great. So you know how we said we were going to improve this lead to MQL rate to 40%. Here's the efforts that we're taking. Here's our progress against that uh, number that we know we need to hit. And, oh, look, we're actually overperforming. Or, yeah, we're not performing where we want to be yet. So we're taking these additional actions. It makes very, very clear how to tie your actions and efforts to the outcomes and necessary strategic actions that need to happen. Absolutely. Um, okay, so I kind of got us to the point where it's like, great, how are we going to make these improvements, right? Uh, so let me step back here because uh, having this data is fantastic, right? Um, uh, and, you know, there's more that we can look at in the data. But there's also the qualitative, right? So we look at the quantitative to see, you know, identify what the problems are. And then we look at the qualitative to say, Okay, now that we've got the numbers, let's look at our audience. Let's look at our messaging. Let's look at our uh, prospects that are converting. Do they exist in a certain industry? Do they exist in a certain job role? Do they exist in a certain, um, you know, are they all requesting a certain product? Are they all coming in on the same kind of um, content offer? Uh, is one content offer better than another? We've got this one that's kind of written for, you know, the executive strategy but then we've got this other one that's written for like very like you know uh, tactical practitioners and what is the performance of those two again this is something that mining your crm data is really going to help and it's going to identify what are the messages and the audience members that are really closely aligned to our offers and that we close very easily um, or at a very high rate when we've identified those people and what makes them tick uh, with qualitative analysis, that's when you know we really start generating a lot of ideas of, great, how are we gonna improve our conversion rate on our ads? Great, how can we improve our landing pages and the messaging that we're putting on there in order to get this audience to take the desired action of talking to our sales team, getting into a discovery call, whatever that next item is. Um, and so this can, you know, the quantitative kind of shows us what the problems are. The qualitative is often going to show us how to solve the problem. Um, and again, this is a great time to pull the team together and align around the data points. And I've got uh, an exercise that you can take home with you that once you've identified the issues, a lot of times in-house teams are going to have a lot of good qualitative research on their audience. Um, and so this stuff may already be in your minds and in your back pocket. So if so, there's a great thing 
that uh, I can walk you through that can generate a lot of ideas and create a lot of alignment very, very quickly. Um, so if there's no questions before that, I'll, I'll jump into that, uh, that exercise. Yeah. One thing that stands out to me, Alex, um, just looking at this, it seems like customer insight is really key mm. here um, because I'm seeing like social listening. I'm seeing reputation mm -hmm. reviews who are mm -hmm. best prospects, customer journey workshop. So um, what are some ways, I know you're kind of describing at a high level how we'll, we can get these insights from customers, but why customer insights and what can those customer insights do for us? I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but I just thought that was interesting. No, not at all. And um, I mean, customer insights are one of the most important because if you get something straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, not to offend any prospects, I love horses, but the words that they use and the things that they identify as their pain points and the things that they need to solve are not always either in the same language as your marketing material um, or maybe your marketing material may be less clear or less precise about those pain points than um, your audience is actually articulating. And so oftentimes talking to the sales team is going to be excellent for this because they're talking to prospects all day, every day. And they're going to be good at kind of anecdotally synthesizing what those conversations look like and the kinds of things that, oh, when a prospect, there's a couple of things that I try to ask and look for when I'm having those conversations where it's like, what is something that once a prospect says it, you're like, oh, your eyes light up and you say, this is going to be a good conversation. What are things that if a prospect says it, you're like, ah, oh, man, this isn't really a good fit. Um, and then what are the things that the prospect gets the most excited about when you talk, when you know, you're talking about them. Those three things are going to allow you to kind of prioritize what's the messaging that we need to hit. Uh, and what are the things that our prospects don't really care about? Uh, and what are the things that identify a bad prospect, which is also extremely valuable? Yep. So if we can focus more on the prospects that are excited by from us and love our brand and you know, are more likely to convert, you know, unless on the prospects that are just going to waste our time, that's where we can scale the moon. That's where we hit an efficiency curve. And I'll give you an example of this because, um, you know, again, here's where the data can become very valuable. Um, and this is pretty cool. So we had some, some data. Um, and again, this goes to the marketing sales conversation, right? Um, we were looking really good on the front end. But, you know, our revenue projections weren't matching up and, okay, great. What do we do? Where is the problem? Where's the gap? We had two um, different sales teams servicing leads that were coming in through the channels that we were managing. And we knew that they were different teams, but we didn't really know what the performance was like across those two teams. So we did an analysis and we were able to see that not only is there a big difference in you know, the performance of these teams. Team A qualified way, way, way more leads than team B did, but this was even more pronounced as the leads became more and more valuable. So we were able to, you know, pretty quickly identify, wow, our most valuable leads are being really poorly served by team B. So let's make sure that we send those and prioritize our lead routing so that, okay, great. Looks like they're doing fine on the lower lead value items. Fine, they can keep those. But I want the highest value people going straight to my hottest team and closing those as quickly as possible. And so this, you know, uh, just changing the lead routing, we were forecasting like, I don't know, 15, 20% revenue improvement. Um, yeah. and, and so again, looking at the data, we can also look and see what are the, the qualifying attributes of somebody. So. Looking at the data again, um, and this is the same same kind of cohort here. We were seeing things like, oh wow, if they um, have a vehicle value when we pull their credit, they are like eighty percent likely to enroll, and if they don't, then they only roll up like a twenty percent. So maybe we should just ask people on that intake form, do you have a car payment that you're paying every month? Because if you do, you're like a red hot lead. I'm going to send you straight to my best closer. Um, right? And I want to find a lot more people that have car payments. Similarly, number of creditors. If you have four or more creditors, um, you know, that's a really big indication of your quality. If you have fewer than that, it's a big indication that you're not as qualified. 
So again, just ask people, how many credit cards do you have? We can immediately identify at the kind of stage of lead generation, whether or not we're generating high quality leads. And uh, that's all driven by the data, right? You know, I, I don't have to guess what questions we need to ask. I don't have to guess what data points we need to look at because I've got the data that I can, that I can mine. Um, and so if there's one thing you take away from this, your data is extremely valuable and there's gold every single time. Yep. And I'd be remiss if I didn't um, drop a plug for the other thing you can do with this data, which is post it back to the ad platforms, right? Because once you know what are the signals that identify a high value prospect versus a low value prospect, both pre what prior to conversion and post conversion, then you can take those signals and train Google and train Facebook to uh, optimize for this, right? To find those people who are more likely to be qualified or more likely to say yes, more likely to convert and become a customer. Yeah, I'm gonna grab this slide real quick just so I can show you what Jarrett's talking about um, in kind of a visual way. Yep. Uh, da, da, da. Hold on one moment. While you do that, I'll just mention it's an incredibly exciting time to be alive because a lot of these things that we're talking about, like customer workshops, user voice and insights, like I remember when I was first getting into this, most of our clients would spend, you know, healthy five or six figures on these expensive consulting firms to run these focus groups and to get at that data. But the data is so accessible now. I don't know, uh, Alex, if you're going to talk about hot jar at all or like um, the Avinash. I'm, I'm not. Poll. I'm not, but those are awesome. But yeah, I mean, it's just like literally the customers will tell you exactly why they are buying, why they're not buying. Um, so Hotjar is a, is a inexpensive and just super powerful way to quickly glean user insights. There's a lot of different, we could have a whole uh, session just on that. But then there's also uh, like we use Gong. Gong is a like a, a revenue intelligence or a call intelligence platform. And there's a whole bunch of cool things you can do with Gong, but one of them is to, it, it transcribes each of the calls automatically, not perfect transcription, but good enough. And you can search through all the language that all the prospects are saying. And like, that's just gold. Like that's literally just, oh my goodness, I can't believe all this is so accessible. And it doesn't take six months. It doesn't take a hundred thousand bucks to commission a huge survey. It's like that data is just there right now and it's queryable. So it's really exciting in that way. But at the same time, it is somewhat of a double-edged sword because of that availability of data. If you're just sitting there every day, like we are sometimes in our larger accounts and just like refreshing the screen and watching that data in real time, it can be easy to mistake signals or to mistake noise for actual signals. Uh, so it is important that you have like a, a baseline strategy, which should be able to be summarized in a sentence or two. It's basically like our strategy is to be the most trustworthy provider in this space. And we're going to do that by educating clients extensively, uh, as well as recognizing that they're not all going to buy immediately. So we're going to have our retargeting program set up. We're going to have our audience, our audience management tools in place, and we're going to create thoughtful segments over time so that, you know, we don't have to win on the first click. We're not expecting to win on the first click. We're expecting to win on the subsequent clicks. And yeah, it just so absolutely. happens that those retargeting clicks are usually much, much cheaper than the first click. Excellent point. Totally. Um, yeah, and the hot jar surveys, surveys are especially good because you can get them up like that. And it's not a survey out to an audience. It's the people that are on your site answering the survey. So they're highly, highly relevant to your business. Um, and I just brought this up because this is kind of what Jarrett was describing, where typically there's not this kind of pre-qualification signal that's being sent back to the ad platform. And so to the ad platform, it looks kind of like this, this top level where it's like, I'm generating leads, but Google is like, I, you know, it's a conversion. I, I think it's valuable. I'm just going to get you more of those. Uh, whereas if we're identifying, hey, these three leads here in green were really high quality, go find me more of those. And I can tell you, I'll send the signal back like, oh, this person said that they have four credit cards. Oh, this person said that, um, you know, they're spending $100,000 a year on SaaS or whatever. Um, great. That's a qualified lead. Go find me more of those. Over time, you're going to find that you're generating a much higher proportion of highly qualified leads. Um, and that's, 
again, super, super exciting. Yeah, and one nuance I'll touch on, um, and this isn't universally true, but um, you know, when we're thinking about B2C versus B2B strategy, often the volumes are very different. So in B2C, especially if you're dealing with a large market and a lot of consumers, you're gonna have a lot of volume of data to, to work with, right? Both in developing your marketing strategy and the data uh, post back approach that we just talked about. So um, the advantage is you can uh, do that more down funnel, right? You can train the algorithms and you can optimize your strategy more down funnel. Whereas if you're in a B2B market, maybe you have a smaller customer base, smaller target addressable market, you know, you're gonna have generally less data just by the numbers to work with. So the approach there, and Alex, maybe you could talk uh, a little bit afterwards about some of the differences between B2C and B2B um, strategy, um, is you want to, in B2B, or if it's like a smaller over, overall volume of prospects in general, is to look to more up, uh, up funnel targets, right? So maybe you don't have enough data to optimize for closed one customers and revenue, but you can optimize for that signal that Alex was just talking about, right? Like. So they fill out the form and say, yes, we spend $100,000 or more on SaaS. If that's a qualifying indicator for you, pass that lead back, right? And only tell Google or Facebook or what, whatever platform you're running uh, when those leads come through, right? And say, optimize for these, not for, you know, these over here that don't meet our criteria, right? And when you do that, you know, Google and Facebook can learn what your ideal customer looks like and give you more of those over time and get better and better at that through their machine learning. Love it. So, like I said, I want to give you all some shortcuts. And this is especially good for internal teams or working across teams. Um, so I would highly encourage you to do this with either like a sales and marketing kind of, you know, get together uh, or like a larger team than you may usually uh, bring in maybe some executives or something like that if it's appropriate. But uh, this is kind of like the trifecta for generating alignment and ideas very quickly. And it's the post up, the red dot, and the priority matrix. So you can do this in person. It's really fun with a whiteboard and sticky notes. It's highly interactive. Uh, this is actually really fun. It was from our first face-to-face -face client meeting in like three years because of the pandemic. And so it's really fun to get to do this in person. But... You can use a tool called Miro, which I've become obsessed with, in order to do this virtually super, super easy. Um, and so uh, this is what it might kind of end up looking like, uh, which believe it or not is actually highly valuable. So let's look at this. Um, we're essentially asking people, okay, now that we've identified what the problems are, what the challenges are, what the opportunities are, Maybe we've already aligned on some, you know, the qualitative uh, insights uh, just to make sure that we're all, you know, talking about the same audience and the same general pain points and, you know, insights there. Then the post-up exercise becomes, okay, how might we solve this challenge? How might we move this rate from, you know, where it is now to double? You know, what, what are some ideas? And then you give everybody seven to 10 minutes Tell them not to look at anybody else's post-its, just generate ideas. Generate ideas, a volume of ideas. I don't want good ideas, I don't want bad ideas. I want every idea that you have. So we're generating a huge volume of ideas. You'll get, I mean, right here, we probably had 50 post-it notes on one side. We had more on the other side. Um, and we did this in like seven minutes. So it generates a ton of ideas. And then what you do is you get these little red dots that people can drag. Everybody gets three, you only get three votes. You drag it to your favorite idea, right? So again, in one minute, everyone in the group has very quickly identified what their favorite ideas are. And we can see, oh, wow, this one seems like something that we should, you know, discuss and prioritize and, you know, figure out how we're going to do this thing. Uh, because a lot of people seem to think it's a good idea. And so other ideas that don't get voted on those are great too. We maybe just scoop them into a parking lot to revisit them, right? Um, either at a later strategy session or when you're going back to the mine for, okay, do we have some other ideas? We need to pivot. Oh, actually, this is more the issue now. Uh, you'll have all those ideas that you've already generated. And then here's the priority matrix where you can take those ideas that were voted on and that got you know the most red dots and you place them very generally on this axis of high value, high effort. 
So anything in the top right is going to be extremely high effort, but extremely high value. Um, and anything in the lower left is going to be maybe something that's very easy to do, but something that's going to have almost no impact, right? So the things that end up in this top left corner, those are the things that you wanna prioritize as like your immediate next steps. The ones in the top right are gonna be the things that you prioritize as, well, we probably need to build out plans and resourcing for these. Uh, it's gonna be a longer term kind of action. Um, and then of course, if something's in the bottom right, don't do it. If something's in the bottom left, deprioritize it. Um, so again, in like 40 minutes-ish, uh, you can look at the data, align on the challenges and opportunities, generate 100 ideas, prioritize your favorite ones, and get next steps. It's an extremely effective exercise, uh, especially for teams that, are, that already have some of that, uh, that data and analysis already done and that they've already aligned around. Yeah, and Alex, it seems like one of the hidden benefits of this whole process is if you have a marketing team and you have a lot of different voices that are contributing, mm. it gets your whole team on board, right? Especially mm. if you're integrating uh, your executives as well, maybe your, maybe your sales team's involved, you know, whoever that is, they get to feel like they're a part of the process so that when you do move forward with a, a strategy and the tactics that align to that strategy, everyone's on board because they've contributed to it. Exactly, and that's why I love the red dot process and this process in general is that it's collaborative and we're doing it together which does mean that you're going to have high levels of alignment across whoever is participating in this. And an extra benefit is that you'll probably hear, oh, wow, this is my favorite meeting of the week because people like to do this kind of stuff. It's energizing and uh, it's probably gonna make the rest of your day better too. Absolutely. Yeah. Powerful tool. Um, Okay, so we've got like 15 minutes left. Um, I think I've hit like the major things I want to make sure I got through. I don't know if we want to open up the questions or if there are other questions that, you know, Jarrett, you wanted to make sure we got to. Yeah, um, guys, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I am curious. Um, so say we, we've gone through this process, we develop a strategy, we select the tactics that fall underneath that strategy, the channels, whatnot. You know, we're executing, you know, we look back in six months, how do we know whether our strategy is working? Like, how can we evaluate our strategy? And, you know, based on that analysis, you know, what are some things we can do or like when or how should we tweak our strategy? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there's, there's a lot to say about this, but the main things I want you to take away are that after you've done the strategic process, you should have it documented and there should be some rigor around it where we've got uh, expectations for performance and the why behind it. And so it doesn't have to be as you know specific as this, but it should be documented where we have specific initiatives that are getting us to our goals. We know what we're doing and why. And ideally we have uh, numbers to hit so that we can evaluate whether or not this is working on an initiative by initiative basis and either redirect resources to uh, shore up something that's not performing as well uh, or take those resources and redirect them to something that's having a much bigger impact. Um, the timing on evaluation is kind of important. So when we are developing these, uh, these plans, we want to look at the down funnel to see what's closing so that we make sure we're, you know, generating the right kinds of leads and traffic. But we should also figure out what are our frontline leading indicators, especially if you have, you know, a six or 12 month sales cycle, it can be really difficult to try and use closed one data in order to evaluate whether or not something's working. Um, and so instead, this is where, again, the qualifying of the leads is incredibly important. If we know those historic conversion rates, then we should have an idea of how many leads we need to generate of a certain quality in order to hit a goal. And then we can look at that frontline metric on a week by week or a month by month basis, see how we're pacing towards that. And then as we get 
the down funnel information, okay, good, we've got them converting to meetings and opportunities at a predictable rate that aligns with what we wanted. Good, it looks like everything's going well. If you've developed your strategy with this process, you'll have the numbers, you'll know what numbers need to be hit. Um, and it becomes a process of just reviewing those and looking at the numbers. Again, not rocket science. Okay, we're, we're missing the mark here. We need to either revisit that, add more resources, uh, do some additional messaging testing, you know, whatever the issue is. Um, and then of course, we uh, ideally on a quarterly basis, take like a big look at uh, closed performance and as much down funnel data as you can. And that's, you know, when I first brought up this, uh, you know, process here, you can see that it actually includes a QBR uh, presentation kind of halfway through where we're aligning on the data and all the findings and everything um, before we go forward and build a strategic plan. So that quarterly review process and that evaluation process is what should be driving any pivots from strategy. So I would highly encourage you not to pivot strategy strategies unless you've done that evaluation and have said this is not working or uh, this is no longer necessary. Yep. So taking that long-term kind of time horizon view of your marketing and looking for like, okay, you know, based on our sales cycles, you know, here's where the leading indicators are showing today, right? And in those leading indicators, here's what's on trend and here's what's off trend, right? then projecting out like if we continue down this path just like we did in that initial strategy right here's where we'll be and then we can look back at those different you know impact points and see like okay what where do we need to focus right for this next month quarter week whatever that look back period is you know to get to our goal right yeah and you know case in point if we were looking at this um and evaluating it again we've got the numbers here but let's say, for example, oh, wow, our click to lead rate like dropped in half. Like, what's going on there? If I also see that our lead quality is greatly improved, that our down funnel conversion rates have greatly improved, and that actually maybe we did some things that increased the quality, but, you know, reduce our lead volume, that could still be meeting our goal, right? Yeah. So you want to look at it holistically uh, as far as, you know, not is this number meeting this number, but are we on trend for, uh, for hitting our goals? Yep. And the other thing um, that I, I just wanted to point out is that this is, you know, our internal process where we're working with clients, but this QBR is intended to generate alignment. And that can be done in an internal team as well with an executive and sales team. Um, and the, the QBR can be a presentation where it's a 90-10 in terms of 90% look back at historical performance and data, finding the insights, challenges, and opportunities there, aligning on those, and then 10%. So that means that we should probably do X, Y, and Z thing. If those X, Y, and Z action items are aligned upon in that QBR, then guess what? You got the green light to go build that out into a true strategic plan. And you've already got the alignment. You don't have to build it out and then workshop it with the whole team all over again, right? Because you're driving the strategy from the data and the insights that have already been aligned upon. I'm not into like doing things over. So I like to get that alignment beforehand. <laughs> this is awesome. So guys, we've got about seven minutes left. Um, you know, if you guys have any questions about strategy, we'd love to field them. Um, Chris, I'm cu just curious in your th thoughts briefly. Um, you know, you've done strategies for hundreds of clients <laughs> um, for obvious reasons. Um, and I'm curious, like, what are some of your highlights or some of your overall thoughts on, on strategy and, and what works in terms of strategy? So <clears throat> I love and agree with everything that Alex uh, is talking about. And, and that applies by channel. So like that activity where like you're looking at your, you know, the water flow chart of your uh, data, like your Facebook ads uh, metrics are going to look way, way different than your Google ads metrics or your display metrics or, or others. Um, there's an element of strategy also, which shouldn't really change all that much. So if we zoom out, there's, there's this element of, uh, I guess you could call the foundational strategy and, and 
you can you can get at that by asking a few questions you can basically ask who are our best customers like who's the ideal client for us and then ask where do they hang out like not just when they're when they're in the market for this product or service but in general online where do they hang out and then third question that you can ask is who on this uh, planet earth has access and attention already to that audience that that's a jay abraham classic because there's somebody out there right now that could make a couple phone calls or a couple introductions and introduce you to a, a hungry pool of uh of beautiful uh clients for yourself so i think on the longer term horizon like it's like there's definitely certain channels that make sense for certain companies in terms of the digital um but don't forget also the elements of strategy which are more enduring longer term generally more difficult to measure still measurable um but have the ability to make a massive you know 10x style difference um classic example of that would be hubspot so hubspot when they started they raised a bunch of money they built a big sales team they were going direct to consumer and having like mediocre success but it wasn't until they focused and made agencies their customer they said you know what let's take a channel based strategy let's let's cozy up with these agencies let's really learn a lot about them and let's compensate them handsomely you know for for a business that they can bring to us and that was really the essence of the strategy that took HubSpot from, you know, 10, 20 million market cap to now it's like four or 5 billion. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, as they were doing that, they, they had individual channel strategies and I'm sure that they were doing many of, uh, many of the types of things that we're talking about here. Uh, but basically just ask who's your best customer, where are they hanging out, who already has their attention that we might be able to just leapfrog uh, and get their attention. And that's really what the whole like influencer marketing uh, piece is about, which is, you know, incredibly powerful. You're just leveraging other people's uh, built in credibility. One other quick thing that I'll suggest um, if you guys are using CRM, it's a great activity to basically export a list. Just imagine a spreadsheet, export a spreadsheet of your best customers, as many as you can get five, like if, if it's only five or 10, that's not ideal, but ideally at least a hundred or um, the, the larger the number of rows, the better. And then across the columns, put everything that you know about them from CRM. So geography, you know, source of the lead, what happened with the lead, the deal size, just everything that you know about those individuals uh, and toss it into Power BI or toss it into, you know, one of these uh, Tableau or any kind of data analysis. You could even do it in, in uh, Excel is do a regression, like a linear regression test to see which of those factors correlate most highly. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then your mission, like on the landing page or on the website is going to be to get individuals to answer those questions, to basically, you know, self segment into themselves, even without requiring a full form submission sometimes, and then to capture that data to train the algorithms. So we're all using AI, whether we know it or not, Google and Facebook have super powerful AI baked in. So we're going to use those data signals to train algorithms uh, as well as using them in real time to have a gauge of lead quality. Yep. And yep. this is exactly how we came up and discovered these things is that process Chris just described. Love it. Beautiful insights, Chris. Well, guys, we're coming up on the hour here. Uh, two things before we wrap. Um, first and foremost, I'm dropping my email in the chat here. Let us know if you want the recording. So just shoot me an email. Um, usually we uh, put out the recording one to two days after uh, these sessions here. So just let me know, um, shoot me a note and I'll get it over to you. And uh, if you're a client, um, feel free to bring up strategy with your team. Um, always good to chat about that. Um, and if you're not a client and want to talk about your situation with one of our experts, uh, since you're a member of our community, we'll hook you up with a free power hour and um, get you connected with one of the folks on our team to um, help you help you learn more. So whether that's your digital strategy or some channel or tactic, we're here to help. And I wanna thank you all for giving up your, uh, you know, an hour of your time to, to spend time with us. 
Absolutely. And we do these every week at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we're going to be coming back next week with a, a fresh session. Um, you know, topic TBD, I think it might be on ads that win the clicks. So stay tuned for that. But uh, we'll let you guys know as soon as we have the topic ready and hopefully see you on the next one. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And thank thanks you, so Alex. Much. Great job. Yeah, thanks. We'll talk soon. All right. Bye-bye.